And I, and I walked in a little bit late, so I don't know if, if Eric covered this, but the, sank, the, um, the sidewalks in the back between our building and the, and the other buildings are all torn up. So we're asking that you go all the way around behind the buildings and come up the back stairs, and that's also for the nursery. There's a side door on the nursery building that you can go in and uh, drop off or pick up your kids. When Pastor Calvin asked if I would cover for him, I began praying for God's guidance on the choice of topic and in preparation for this sermon. And I believe God is leading me to share with you a challenging topic of Scripture, a topic that has been and continues to be um, an area that convicts and challenges me. To the best of my ability, I will attempt to accurately present God's word on this topic. Some of the scripture we're going to be diving into is very difficult to hear, much less comprehend and apply. It challenges our ideas of God and salvation and our role in God's redemptive plan. Because of the sensitive nature of this topic, you may find yourself offended by parts of this sermon. Please realize that I've agonized about how to deliver this message. God knows, and I know, that I'm woefully inadequate to speak on his behalf. Most of the scripture I'll be using in this sermon was spoken directly by Jesus himself, and I'll indicate that in red lettering on the slides. The book of Matthew is a first-hand account of the teachings of Jesus. Matthew, one of the twelve disciples, wrote the book of Matthew to capture his eyewitness account of the life, death, resurrection, and teaching of Jesus. In many Bibles, the book of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7, are written almost entirely in red ink. And if you're a student of the Bible, you realize that red letters are often used by publishers to indicate when Jesus is speaking in the New Testament. For those of us meeting here, or in any church for that matter of fact, I think one of the most frightening sayings of Jesus is recorded in Matthew 7:21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What does Jesus mean by, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven? This teaching seems to conflict with Ephesians 2, verse 8, which says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Matthew 7:21 implies that it is not enough for us to call Jesus Lord, but we must do the will of God. And Ephesians 2.8 says that we're saved by faith and not by works. So which is it? Faith, works, or faith plus works? What is really necessary for salvation? The Bible is clear all over Scripture from cover to cover. The Bible tells us that we are saved by faith in Jesus. We're saved by Jesus because he paid the price for our sins against God. He endured God's holy wrath, which was due us because of our sin, by dying in our place. There is no denying the fact that every one of us, even the best of mankind, has sinned against God. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because of God's unchangeable, undeniable, righteous character, God must be just. Our sin must be atoned for. You see, God does not simply wipe away or forget our sin. He takes away our sin by taking the punishment for our sin upon himself. God gives each of us a choice. We can either pay the penalty for our sin and be condemned to hell for all eternity, or we can trust in the sacrifice of Jesus and accept his substitution on our behalf. Jesus bore God's holy wrath that was against us in our sin. He took it upon himself on our behalf. Isaiah, over 700 years before Jesus' death, prophesies of Jesus' substitutionary death. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. There is nothing we can do to earn salvation. No amount of good works can overcome our transgressions before God. It is only by faith in Jesus that we can be saved. So why does Jesus warn us that not everyone who says to him, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven? A question I want to pose to you. Is it possible to be spiritually deceived? Is it possible for us to believe that we are saved and in fact not? Hear what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate, For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, 
and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Only a few find it. Is it possible for us to believe we're on the narrow road that leads to heaven and actually be on the broad road that leads to destruction? How can we know that we truly have been saved? I believe Matthew 7.21 is a huge warning sign given to us by Jesus to alert us to the possibility of spiritual deception. We're going to spend the rest of our time together examining scripture and our hearts to encourage us toward the calling God has for each one of us. I want to be careful here. The last thing I want to do is put doubt in the mind of those who really are in Christ. However, I think you'll agree that the stakes are so high, infinite eternal life with God or infinite eternal punishment by God. This is an area where we just cannot afford to be wrong. It merits serious study of scripture and self-reflection. I think the last thing we all want to hear from Jesus the day we face God is spoken by Jesus in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What dreadful words, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Look carefully at this passage. Who is Jesus talking to? The people he is addressing are apparently very religious people. After all, they prophesied in the name of Jesus. They drove out demons in his name and performed many miracles. Clearly, these are not atheists or agnostic people, but very religious. In fact, they would probably call themselves Christians. They clearly prophesied, drove out demons, and performed miracles in Jesus' name. Could it be that such people may be sitting right next to you in this church? Could it be that Jesus does not know you or me? I hope you can see the seriousness of this question. I've wrestled with this question quite a bit, and I'll attempt to share with you how I believe Scripture answers it. If we go back to Ephesians and continue reading, I'll back up and read the entire passage. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What does Paul mean by, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do? Is it possible for us professing Christians regular church attenders to be spiritually deceived. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, please turn with me to, to Revelation 3. For those who have a red-letter Bible, you will see that these passages are also written in red. This scripture is the spoken word of Jesus to John for the churches. We're going to look at three of seven churches Jesus addresses in Revelation. To the church in Sardis. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Jesus gives the church in Sardis a stern warning to wake up. The church in Sardis was known as a peaceful, beautifully adorned church. There was no threat of persecution from the outside and no heresy from within. The church had the appearance of being religiously proper. G.B. Card calls Sardis the perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. George Ladd called the church in Sardis a picture of nominal Christianity, outwardly prosperous, busy with the externals of religious activity, but devoid of spiritual life and power. 
Jesus told the church in Sardis that you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead, your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. According to Jesus, there were only a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. The vast majority of the church members of the church in Sardis are or were on the brink of eternal destruction. Where does our church stand in comparison to the church in Sardis? Are we a picture of nominal Christianity? Are we outwardly prosperous, busy with the externals of religious activity? Are we devoid of spiritual life and power? These are important questions for the church to contemplate. But more importantly, these are questions of dire importance for each of us professing Christians to contemplate. Will Jesus declare that you are worthy to be dressed in white and walk with him? Worthy. Jesus' word, not mine. To the church in Philadelphia, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, since you have kept my command to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus says that I know your deeds. You have kept my word and not denied my name. Jesus goes on to say that since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole earth. The church in Philadelphia stands in stark contrast to the church in Sardis. Jesus commends the church in Philadelphia for their deeds. Jesus says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. The church has kept Jesus' command to endure patiently. The church in Philadelphia was holding true to the commands and teachings of Jesus despite persecution and pressures of the pagan culture surrounding the church. Jesus says that the one who is victorious, I will, make a, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, which apparently is a very, very good thing. So time for some personal reflection. There is no denying that Jesus knows our deeds. Are we keeping his commands? Are we holding fast to his truth? Are we standing firm against the values and influences of our pagan culture, or have we become politically correct and blended in with our pagan culture? To the church in Laodicea, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say that I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's look at the church in Laodicea. Jesus starts with, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, 
I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. This is sharp criticism by Jesus. Jesus is not talking to a group of Muslims or Buddhists, Mormons, or atheists. Jesus is talking to the Christian church. He is saying the church in Laodicea is lukewarm, and he is going to spit them out of his mouth. The church in Laodicea, like the church in Sardis, was complacent. However, the church in Laodicea also had an attitude of self-sufficiency. They were a wealthy bunch who said that they did not need a thing. Jesus said that, in fact, they were wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Sadly, of the seven churches described by Jesus in Revelation, only the church in Laodicea did Jesus not have one single positive thing to say. To the church in Laodicea, Jesus concludes by saying, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. The churches described by Jesus in Revelation are Christian churches filled with professing followers of Christ. I hope this is as startling to you as it is to me. In our culture, especially American culture, I'm afraid we've dumbed down what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, and what it means to be saved to something that simply is not biblical. Nowhere do we see in Scripture describing salvation as a one-time emotional confession to Christ We say things like, say this prayer, walk the aisle, sign this card, get baptized, and you're in. In our culture, many, many people believe they are Christian simply because they're American, born in a Christian society. We consider a good Christian as someone who attends church regularly. Many Christians believe that because they've had an emotional profession of faith that their sins are forgiven, and they go off living their lives exactly like before exactly like the rest of the non-Christians in our culture, believing that God will now tolerate their blatant sinful life. And I'm here to tell you that's a lie straight from the synagogue of Satan. Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is clear that obedience to God is not optional, but of eternal utmost importance. Let me ask you a question. When you visit the doctor, why is it the first thing to do after collecting your insurance and copay is they take your temperature with a thermometer. An elevated temperature reading can be a clear indicator that something is actually wrong with a patient. The thermometer will not tell the doctor if you have a flu or an appendicitis. However, it will clearly inform the doctor that something is not right. Let me ask you another question. Why is money such an important topic in the Bible? Do you know that money is the main subject of nearly half the parables Jesus told? In addition, one in every seven verses in the New Testament deals with this topic. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, fewer than 500 verses on faith, and more than 2,000 verses on money. What is it about money that is so important to God? Does God need our money? Certainly not. Why then the emphasis on money? I believe it is very difficult for us to ascertain our true spiritual condition. It seems to me that God has given us a spiritual thermometer in the handling of our personal finances. Much like a thermometer can tell us that something is physically wrong with our bodies, the way we handle our personal finances can tell us something is wrong with our heart. Our checkbooks can be a true indicator of our spiritual health. Remember the church in Laodicea? They were the wealthy people with little to no reliance on God. They trusted their wealth to their harm. As Solomon puts it in Ecclesiastes 5.13, I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. God's command to tithe cannot be any clearer. However, there is some confusion about exactly what is tithing. Some people believe that simply giving some money to church is tithing. According to God, tithing is giving a full tenth part or 10% for earnings back to God. God says in Malachi 3, You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will be not room enough to store it. Does God need our tithe? Absolutely not. He does not need our money. He does not need our praise. He does not need our worship. God can raise up stones to worship him. The issue of tithing is all about our trust in and obedience to God. Do we really trust God, and will we truly obey God? 
At the heart of it, do we treasure our pleasures of this world more than God? Now, my purpose here is not to convince, coerce, or even ask you to tithe. I'm simply pointing out that our checkbooks can be for us an easy-to-read, unbiased assessment of our trust in God. Do we truly believe in his promises? Will we be obedient to God, even if it costs us some of our earthly pleasures? If you don't tithe, realize you're in good company. According to numerous polls, only 3 to 5% of church attenders actually tithe. That is, give 10% of their income back to God. Only 3 to 5% tithe. That means 95 to 97% of church attenders are not obeying the commands of God in regard to tithing, or as God sees it, robbing God. They are valuing their earthly treasures over God. Remember Jesus' stern condemnation of the Laodiceans, the wealthy, self-reliant church. Unlike the other churches described in Revelation, Jesus didn't even say that there were a few Laodiceans worthy to be dressed in white and walk with him. He said, so be earnest and repent. Likewise, remember Jesus' teaching in Matthew 7.13, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Only a few find it. Just because we find ourselves with the majority, we should not make assumptions that God must be pleased with our deeds. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not saying that if you don't tithe, then you are not or will not be saved, nor am I saying that if you do tithe, you are or will be saved. But it seems that given God's emphasis on money, each one of us must seriously consider if we are being obedient in the area of our finances. And if not, why not? Do we truly believe? Most people are familiar with the story of the crucifixion of Christ, how he was crucified with two thieves, one on the left and one on the right. While all three were nailed to their crosses, and after a period of taunting Jesus by the two thieves, one of the two thieves repented. Jesus said to that thief that today you'll be with me in paradise. Clearly, the repentant thief did not have time to do anything, no good deeds, no act of sacrificial giving, yet God knew his heart. Only God knows the true nature of our hearts. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. With regard to tithing, I believe we can use tithing as an indicator of our heart, our spiritual health. There was a time in my faith journey where I didn't tithe. I had made a profession of faith, been baptized, regularly attended church. When the offering plate passed, I would grudgingly drop a 20 in the plate. It seemed I had more expenses than income. As time went on, my wife and I struggled to give a few percent to the church, and placing the check in the offering plate was done under a sense of obligation. After all, the church had to pay the electric bill, and the pastor has to make a living too. It wasn't until after spending about a year in a discipleship class, spending considerable time reading and studying scripture and the topic of tithing, that I had that aha moment and realized that tithing was not for the church's sake or even for God's sake. Tithing was a willful step of faith and obedience for my sake. At this point in our married life, our second child had just been born. We moved into a slightly bigger house in Chesapeake with a bigger mortgage. My wife had just quit her job to be a stay-at-home mom. For years, we'd been struggling with credit card debt and unable to to ever get out from under it. We had now managed to increase our our giving to church to to a 5%. And with much prayer and a huge step of faith, we decided to double our giving to 10%. It didn't make any financial sense. We were buried under debt, had just significantly increased our living expenses and cut our income. In a leap of faith, we started giving regularly at 10%, and somehow God provided sufficient funds to cover our monthly living expenses. Looking back on it, even my attitude about giving changed. Before, I was giving out of a sense of obligation. Now we were giving out of a sense of thankfulness, praise, and faith. Every month, we somehow had sufficient funds in our account to cover the electric bills, or cover the bills. Additionally, over a period of about a year of faithful tithing, our credit card debt dwindled and vanished, and by the grace of God, we've remained out of debt to this day. For me, my experience with tithing was nothing short of a miracle. We didn't start tithing to get God's financial blessing. We started tithing purely out of an earnest heart to obey and follow God, and trust that somehow God would see us through. Our experience with tithing was one of the most profound, faith-expanding experiences I've had as a follower of Christ. So back to Scripture. Let's look at what the Bible says about being saved, becoming a follower of Christ, a Christian. 
Go back with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. There is so much we could unpack from this verse. But for the sake of time, we're going to jump to the conclusion of the verse that we are saved through faith in Jesus. We are not saved by our works or by, by any innate worth or goodness or of our own merit, but only by God's grace through our faith in Christ. We're saved by faith. So we need to ask the question then, what is the difference between the apparent false faith held by the vast majority of the congregation of the church in Sardis and Laodicea and the saving faith held by, the, by many in the church in Philadelphia? I think by American cultural standards, we would assume that they were all good church-going Christians worthy of spending eternity with God in heaven. But according to Jesus, clearly this is not the case. So what does saving faith look like? I believe James, the brother of Jesus, helps us understand saving faith. James 2, 14 through 24 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God? Good. Even demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Deeds. Deeds are all over the Bible. Jesus talks about our deeds being incomplete in Revelation. John talks about our deeds almost on equal terms with faith. What is it about deeds that the Bible, from cover to cover, emphasizes our deeds? If we're saved by faith, then why is Jesus so focused on our deeds? After all, he has the power to forgive all of our sins, including the sins of our deeds or lack thereof, in the case of not caring for the needs of the naked, cold, starving people around us. What is it then that is so important about our deeds? I believe what the Bible is teaching us about deeds is that our deeds, much like our checkbooks, our deeds are a true indicator of our faith. Paraphrasing James, our faith is made complete by what we do. Scripture is clear that we're not saved because of our good deeds, but only by our faith in Jesus. Likewise, the Bible is clear that true faith in Christ will be evident by our deeds. In Luke 10, 25 through 28, Jesus is having a conversation with a religious expert. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. The question I ask myself, do I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength, and all my mind? Do I love my neighbor as myself? If you're honest with yourself, you'll find that these are quite humbling questions. What does it look like for a human to love their creator? To be honest, this is hard for me to grasp. Our love for God should be more intense and extreme than any earthly love. If I looked at how I love my wife, for example, and equate this to my love for God, how does it measure up? This is not a perfect example because our love for God should far exceed the love we have for our wife. But just go with me. Question one, do I spend time with my wife? If I never came home and spent time with my wife, never asked her how her day went, never listened to her needs, trials, issues, 
never held her in my arms, wiped her tears, or rejoiced with her in her victories, what kind of love would that be? I'm pretty sure we would not have a close, lasting relationship. Do I spend time with God? Do I spend sincere, honest time with God? Do I listen to God? Do I pray to God out of sincere reverence and love? Or do I find myself praying with my wish list to get good things? Or when I need to get out of trouble? Or maybe just at mealtimes, because that's what I was taught to do. Do I read and study his word? To be honest with you, I'm ashamed that it was not until relatively recently did I truly understand and come to appreciate my soul's need to spend time in daily prayer and reading his word. I can tell you that Satan in our own sinful and naturally selfish heart does not want us to read this book. It was only through a pure act of obedience that I started to daily spend time in scripture. Now I treasure my daily time with and in God's word. Question two, do I treasure my wife? Do I spend my resources on her? Do I find pleasure in providing for her needs or do I financially and emotionally neglect her? When I love my wife, I spend my time, money, talents, all that I have to provide for her. Now, it's true that God does not need us in the same way, but he does want us to truly love him. Do I neglect God by spending all of my resources on myself? Is there any left for God? Do I expend my time, talents, money, first on myself and give whatever is last to God? Do I love God more than life itself? Do I pour out myself for the glory of God? Do I treasure worshiping him in his church? Or do I look for legitimate reasons or opportunities to avoid church? Jesus says in Luke 14, 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Jesus is not teaching that we should hate our relatives, but that our love for God should be so strong and intense that in comparison, our love for our father, mother, wife, children, even our own life should look like hate. We are to love God far more deeply, passionately than our closest human relationship, including our own life. Question number three, am I obedient to the calling as a husband? Am I faithful, pure, and true to my wife? Do I forsake my desires for the sake of my wife and our relationship? How about God? Am I faithful to the calling as a Christian? Am I obedient to the teachings of Christ, to the calling he has for me? Do I forsake my earthly desires for the glory of God, for the advancement of the gospel? In our flesh, I, we, look at these sacrifices as burdens, don't we? From our own experiences, when we expend ourselves in love to our spouse, the return we get back far outweighs our perceived sacrifices. And the Bible is clear that when we love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength and all of our mind, the return on our perceived sacrifices will be immeasurable, far beyond our wildest imagination. If someone was to ask you, what must I do to be saved, what would you say? What does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? From the very start of Jesus' ministry, Jesus began to to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Peter, shortly after receiving the Holy Spirit, while giving the very first Christian sermon, told the crowds to repent and be baptized. I'm afraid that much like the churches in Laodicea and Sardis, we've become quite comfortable with a picture of salvation that does not cost us anything. We call Jesus our our Savior, but we don't submit to his lordship. However, Scripture emphasizes that Jesus is not just our Savior, but that he is our Lord. Take the book of Acts. In Acts, Jesus is referred to as Lord 92 different times and as Savior only two times. We cannot have Jesus as just our Savior. He must be Lord of our lives. If he's not your Lord, he cannot be your Savior. What exactly does Lord mean? We think of Lord as a formal religious title for Jesus, but Lord is more than a title. It also implies a relationship. According to Webster's Dictionary, the definition of Lord is one having power and authority over others, a ruler by hereditary right or preeminence to whom service and obedience are due. 
When we recognize Jesus as Lord, we acknowledge that Jesus has all authority over us, and we will serve and obey him. Christian, is Jesus Lord of your life? Question, how is your faith, your belief in Jesus any different than Satan's? You both know that Jesus is God's son. You both know that Jesus came to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. You both know that Jesus died on the cross and three days later rose from the dead. You both know that Jesus is coming back to judge the living and the dead. Don't miss this. Intellectual knowledge about Jesus does not equate to saving faith in Jesus. The difference is Satan will not voluntarily submit to Jesus as Lord to serve and obey him. Will you? If Jesus is your Lord, you will obey his commands. Your deeds will be the evidence that he is, in fact, your Lord. If such deeds are not evident in your life, then you are not obeying and serving Jesus. This implies that Jesus is not your Lord, and he cannot be your Savior. Jesus tells us in John 8, 51, Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Remember Luke 10, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. Christian, if you do not truly have a heart to serve and obey God, if you find yourself disobedient to God's commands, casual in prayer, uninterested in studying his word, apathetic in worship, uninvolved in serving in his church, or unwilling to spend your life advancing his gospel, I urge you, do not wait for your feelings to come around. They may never change. Don't be deceived. In the words of Jesus, wake up. Your works, or lack thereof, reveal the true state of your faith. It is by your works that the genuineness of your faith is laid bare before God. Instead of waiting for your feelings to change, make up your mind to really believe. That is, to truly trust in Jesus. Start being obedient to the teaching and commands of God. Start reading God's word daily, and you'll soon have a mind that knows God and understands his commands. Soon you'll have a soul that yearns for God. Start tithing, and soon you'll have a heart that loves God. You'll find yourself gladly and cheerfully giving. Jesus says in Luke 12, 24, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Note the order of the wording Jesus used. He didn't say where your heart is, your treasure will be, but where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Start serving God and you'll have a spirit that adores God. The beauty is that we don't have to conjure up the will to change our heart. We can't. Only God can change our heart. And God promises to do just that, to change our heart and to change our desires. It is our responsibility to believe, to really believe. Do this, and God will change your heart. As it says in Ezekiel, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people, and I will be their God. The Bible is full of examples of men and women who faithfully obeyed God even when they did not feel like it. I assure you, Abraham did not feel like obeying God and sacrificing his son. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus did not feel like going to the cross to die for you. Matthew 26, 39 records, Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. In many ways, I believe it is easier to draw the line between saving faith and false faith in countries where persecution is alive. In such places, you have to decide, is God worth dying for? When you come to Jesus, you do so knowing full well that it may cost you your family, your loved ones, or even your own life. Here in America, we don't face such a test. It is entirely possible for us to join a church, regularly attend worship, even serve as a pastor or elder, and think we're a follower of Christ. We humans have an amazing ability to rationalize anything. In our mind, we believe that we're a follower of Christ, but we've never had to truly decide if we're willing to lay down our lives for the glory of God. Sadly, here in America, 
the wealthiest people to ever walk the face of the earth, 95 to 97% of professing Christians won't even lay down their checkbooks for God. Jesus warns us that it is entirely possible to spend our entire life in the church in Sardis or Laodicea, living a deceived, unfruitful life, believing we're on the narrow road that leads to heaven and actually be walking on the broad road that leads to destruction. In the words of Jesus, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In light of all this, let's make up our mind to really believe in God, trust in his promises, and obey his commands. Our deeds, the outward living of our inward faith, brings great glory to God. Let's live our lives spending every moment loving the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and all of our strength and with all of our mind and loving our neighbor as ourself. So on that day, we will hear Jesus say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness.